You are Vikings, heroes from rivaling clans sometime about the year 1000. And after a long, arduous journey, you have finally found yourself upon Thor's Cliff, a beautiful island inhabited by mostly peaceful farmers, and there are merchants as well. And in the center of this island, a sanctuary to Thor's daughter. And your whole goal in order to win the game is to get this child's blessing. And you can earn this child's blessing in one of three different ways. The first way is to deliver these blood red ambers from the beaches of Thor's Cliff to the sanctuary in the center of the board. Once you have delivered three there with your hero figure, you will have won the game. The second way is to collect three of Loki's tears, which are these blue crystals, and you can gain these by defeating the trolls that surround the sanctuary on the island. Collect three and you can win the game. And the last and final way is to erect a rune stone on one of the crevice spaces on the game board and have that standing after four total turns. If you are able to do any of those three things, you will have gained Thor's daughter's honor and won Thor's Cliff. On a single turn of the game, you're going to be repeating these steps and then play is going to continue clockwise around the table. The first thing that you are going to do every turn is move. You're able to move your hero. You're also able to move any of the figures that you have, whether they're your warriors or your goad, which we will get into in a little bit, but you're able to move them all typically just one space. Then you're going to do combat, which combat in this game is pretty simple. There are four types of dice. There are going to be small dice, medium dice, medium black dice, as well as large dice. And you're going to be rolling a certain number of those depending on the stats of the figures fighting. Next, you are going to be collecting silver, which is collected by looking at where your warriors are on the board, and depending on how many warriors you have in the same terrain type, you're going to collect one less of that amount in silver. Then you've got the action phase. Your hero, if they're on a action space or a crevice, they're able to do an action. So if they're at the farm, they could drink mead, or if they are at the market, they could also drink mead. They can also buy items at the market and at the farm, they can acquire a bison in order to move faster, but we'll get into all that. And in the recruitment step, you're able to get new pieces onto the board in the form of those warriors or goads. The warriors you're able to get easily to just basically spend silver and you're able to add them onto the board in the same spaces that you either have warriors already or in your hero's space. Goads are a little bit harder to make. You actually have to have your warriors in certain spaces on the map as well as silver in order to recruit a goad. And a goad is just kind of a special priest unit. You can only get one of them and they have a special power and unlock a phase right before everything that you do on your turn where you're actually going to be switching the ability of that goad. So that is pretty much it with what your turns entail. Movement, combat, silver collection, your action space, recruitment, and you're going to be repeating those over and over. Let's talk a little bit in detail about some of the actions that your hero might get by standing on these special spaces on the board. The first is going to be the actions that you can do on the farm. Now, the first one is going to be you're able to pay one silver in order to drink mead and regain up your life points by two. Another use for Amber, other than bringing them into the sanctuary in order to kind of move forward your win condition, you can also sell them at the farm in order to get five silver. So this can really help in a pinch if you need some silver for recruitment, but you don't actually have your warriors working at the moment, so you're really not able to gain a lot of silver. This is another way that you can gain that silver. The second thing is you can actually buy a bison. In order to do this, you're going to need one of your warriors at each of a different terrain type along the board, as well as have five coins. This will permanently increase your hero's movement by one and you also get a cool figure that will replace the one that you currently have where your figure is now riding the bison. And then we've got the market. There is a couple more actions that you can do at the market. The first being you can drink mead just like at the farm. The second being a gamble action where you're able to pay a certain amount of money in order to roll a certain number of dice. 
and you're going to be gaining money equal to the value on the dice. So essentially just gambling. You can buy a potion in which you can get a potion of haste, which will give you an extra phase at the very, very end of your turn where you can get an extra movement or maybe a potion of strength where you add a die to your combat. There's a lot of different options there. You can also buy a Warhammer, making your basic attacks even stronger as your hero. Or you can also get the helmet, in which there is only one of these helmets, and if you buy it, you are the only one to get it. This gives your hero one point of protection, which will make a lot more sense once we get into the details on how combat works. So then we also got the actions on these crevice spaces, and these are going to be separated around Thor's Cliff at the beginning of the game. The silver tile allows your hero to actually collect a silver coin. The hot spring tile allows your hero to gain four health. And the kobold tile allows you to buy a potion at a discounted rate than the market. Yes, combat gets its own section in the game, mostly because I'd rather just explain it really, really quickly. That way, every time I reference it, you can kind of understand. So every piece in the game has a combat dice value. So the trolls will actually have three medium dice. Your hero will start with two medium dice and your warriors all start with one small dice. And when you are in combat with another player, you are essentially going to be rolling the dice equal to all of your characters in that hex at the exact same time as whoever your opponent is at the time. Then you are actually going to be assigning those dice to figures. So you might be rolling a ton of dice against your opponent. And in that space, there is your opponent's hero, but there's also all of these warriors. Yes, you can assign all of those dice towards the hero in order to essentially target the hero. However, protection points, this is where protection points become in Important. It's why the helmet's so good. It's why being on one of the trolls kind of cliff areas or mountains are so good. It's because when you have a protection point, you actually suck up the highest roll. So whatever the highest value roll that you have is, that is going to be negated by a protection point. So it's a really, really good way to cut down the amount of damage you are receiving. But essentially this damage is dealt immediately to both parties. And if you are the attacker and you were not able to clear everything out of that hex, you actually have to retreat back to an adjacent space. Now let's talk about the unit types that we have in the game. Obviously there are going to be the hero figures. These are what's going to carry your crystals. They're going to be carrying the amber. They are also going to be the ones erecting the rune stones and getting those special actions on those spaces. However, when they are defeated, they will drop everything they have, the gold, the crystals that they currently have on them, and also any amber that they actually currently have on them that's not delivered yet to the sanctuary. So you have to make sure that your hero is safe at all times. And then you You've got your basic warriors represented by these here discs. They have two life points and they fight with one small dice. They basically sub as your fighters and your workers. They are going to be collecting you silver, but they're also going to be doing your battles for you in a really good way to supplement your hero in campaigns against the trolls in order to get those blue crystals or campaigns against your opponent's pieces. And then you lastly, you've got the goad who is kind of the glue that kind of keeps your clan together. One of the things that I love most about the goad is kind of the options that you get with them. They're a little bit harder to recruit. You have to have your warriors in two forest spaces and have enough coin in that recruitment phase. But once you get that one goad that you can get during the game, you can actually change the goad's ability at the beginning of each of your turns. And these goad's abilities are extremely powerful. The first being the berserker ability, essentially making all of your warriors move too, kind of like every one of them had a bison all of a sudden. And the second ability is the heal, where they can essentially heal your hero by by two pips of health if they are adjacent to your hero or in the same space as your hero during the silver collection phase. And lastly, my personal favorite, we've got the lightning strike, a way to roll the black dice, which is kind of unblockable damage and basically kill something that is at an adjacent space with you. So goads are kind of a really good piece to have on the board, but kind of at a distance or a little bit kind of supporting your warriors or your hero in their campaigns. And losing them really does hurt because then you have to hope that you have your warriors in those two forests again in order to get them back into the game board. Mm -hmm. 
there are four characters that come with the base game of Thor's Cliff. The first let's talk about is going to be Olif the Gambler. Now, Olif actually has a special power where they are actually able to gamble at a cheaper price. Gambling in the game is where you will essentially be paying silver to roll a certain number of dice at a market space in order to gain more money. Gambling. However, Olive can do it at a discounted rate. But then we've also got Raghild, who will receive a protection point when fighting the trolls, so she has a bit of an advantage going up and collecting those blue crystals. They also get the bison at a discounted price. And then we've got Jorund, who is able to increase his life total by selling ambers at those farms. He's actually able to get stronger as he does that. In addition to gaining silver, he's able to also increase his life total. And another ability is that he is able to buy and upgrade his axe to a Warhammer for a cheaper price. And lastly, we've got Bera the Nimble, who is able to buy potions at a cheaper cost and is able to actually get two potions a turn if bought. And her other side ability is that she actually gets an extra use out of the Potion of Haste. So moving around the board, doing combats, collecting silver, doing your actions and recruiting new pieces to the game board is essentially the puzzle of Thor's Cliff. It's kind of an area control game, yet also a pick up and deliver game, while heroes are going to be going back and forth between the beach and the sanctuary and fighting the trolls and all the meanwhile kind of maintaining that silver supply of how many warriors do I want on the board and where do I want them? Do I want to spread them out in order to collect a lot of silver on each of my turns, or do I want to kind of put them all in one space? Space in order to become one big ball of destruction and go around the island killing everything in my path. How early do I want to go for the goad in order to kind of pressure my opponent with that lightning strike? That was one thing I did in my games is I like to get the goad early and essentially put it on one of the sides of one of my opponents and just start taking out their warriors really, really easily easily and from a little bit of a distance. There are so many different choices every turn, but it doesn't seem overwhelming. It has this certain kind of simplistic charm to it, yet every decision still matters. Oftentimes you will be balancing one or two of these win conditions and the rune ends up kind of being that third way of attempting to win if the other two might not have worked or to build up pressure for your opponents in order to force them to come to you. But oftentimes players are going to be, you know, going heavily for those ambers. That's the most straightforward, but it's very dangerous because if you are killed on the way there, you will drop those items and an opponent can now then have an amber close to the same sanctuary for themselves. The game goes two to four players, therefore at a two player game it's a lot more like chess where you are going to be battling up against just your opponent and it is going to be that tug of war type feel, whereas at three and four it becomes a little bit more political on the outside of the game board as players are going to be convincing each other to slow down a certain player who is kind of scourging up and winning the game very quickly or at least getting a lead. And the good news is if you want to make it even more complex, this is just the base game that I have covered, but there is actually already a Thor's Cliff 2 campaign coming out. And in that campaign, there is going to be another asymmetric faction to the game. So now all four of these Viking characters that you can play, you can actually play the Skraelings in this expansion to the game. And this adds even more to the asymmetry. They don't work the same as other players. Instead of using their warriors placement for buying bisons and all that such. In order for them to gain resources, they actually have to do it with their camps that they lay down. And they have much, much less warriors, but their warriors collect silver if they are alone on the island and have no pieces surrounding them, not even their own. And the Skraelings have to be managing a much different game where they're going to be figuring out in which order they want to get a bear or the wolf or the eagle and kind of working all of those different animals and their different varying abilities so the asymmetry really does increase the more you play and at that two player count it is a very tight very interesting asymmetric game. 
but I hope that that was a good overview of what Thor's Cliff has to offer and maybe get you interested in this game. If you want more information, there's going to be a link to the campaign page for Thor's Cliff 2 right down below. And there you can kind of check out in detail more about what is coming in that expansion. But I hope that you were able to enjoy the way that I was able to present how the game works here and kind of how the game feels as well. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go ahead and drop the beat.